Greetings and welcome to another lecture in psychopathology or abnormal psychology, however you want to put it. This one involves the substance disorders. This involves various types of addictive behavior, most of which we consider to be two psychoactive drugs, although there is a small exception near the end. So, I'm going to start out with some vocabulary in order to make sure that you more or less understand uh, terminology as it is generally used. The first is addictive behavior. Um, addictive behavior is based on the pathological need for a substance. You have to have it. You must have it. Uh, you either psychologically have to have it or you physiologically have to have it. It's just that simple. So people will then do behavior to get that substance, presumably, and that's part of the addictive behavior. Substance abuse. Now, you can use a substance without it be su being substance abuse. You can use psychoactive drugs without it being abuse. Um, abuse usually means that there is some kind of hazardous behavior or the drug is doing damage, but people still keep using it. They're using it to the extent that it becomes a problem. So just do realize that not all substance use is abuse. Substance dependence is just what it sounds like. Dependent is the word that is generally used these days instead of addictive. Because addictive is a word that has really been overused. People are addicted to everything these days. And so psychologists and doctors have oftentimes moved on to dependence. And also because dependence really describes nicely what is going on here. People depend on the drug. They feel they need to have it in order to function properly. There's two types of dependence. The first is psychological dependence, where the person really wants to feel the way they do when they are on the drug. It is not that their body only functions well when it's on the drug. That's the next one. But people want to feel the way they do when they're taking it. And they'll do anything in some cases to feel like that again. That's psychological dependence. Now, Psychological dependence can be a little or a lot. Most of people who, most of us who use uh, psychoactive drugs can probably take or leave them. You know, it's not a big deal. I take it, I don't take it. But people who are psychologically dependent are truly driven to use them. Just, they, they, they can't stop. Now, physical tolerance is when the body itself has adapted to the presence of the drug. So the body has adapted so that the body really needs the drug in order to function properly. If it doesn't have the drug, it doesn't function properly. Best example of this that you probably run into is caffeine. If you are addicted to caffeine or you are physically dependent, I should say, on caffeine, you know it. Because if you don't get the caffeine, you're exhausted, you're grumpy, and you probably have a really vicious headache. The reason for that is that your body is prepared for you to drink caffeine. Your body really doesn't want you to get high on caffeine the way that you really want to get high on caffeine. It wants you to stay at the level of arousal that you're normally at. Okay, that's that's where it wants you to be. But you want to be higher, literally and figuratively. And so you take the drug. And so your body responds to that by dropping your level of arousal so that when you take the drug, it simply boosts you back up to where you were before. Well, then what happens, of course, if you don't take the drugs, your body has just depressed itself for no reason, and you have a headache, and you're tired, and you're grumpy. So uh, that's called withdrawal. Withdrawal symptoms are physical symptoms that occur when the person does not get a drug, and it is, just, is a sign of physical dependence. As is tolerance, because what do people do when that one cup of coffee doesn't get them quite as wired as it used to? What do they do? They drink two or three. So it takes two or three cups of coffee to get that same feeling of being wired on caffeine that one cup of coffee could do earlier. That's tolerance. That's a drug tolerance. And that also is a sign that the person has become physically dependent on a drug because their drug has adapted to function best while on it. Now, for the most part, physical dependence can be over with in a week or two. You know, when you're talking things like caffeine or, uh, you know, maybe not alcohol. Alcohol is a special thing. But generally, you know, you, you can be over it relatively quickly. 
And then all of the drive afterwards to get it is basically psychological. This is not to say the psychological dependence is easier to do, deal with than physical. It is not. In fact, it's harder. Uh, ask anybody who's given up nicotine. Nicotine is an example of a drug that you can have both physical and psychological dependence on. And even though you might get over the physical dependence in a week or two, the psychological dependence is going to stick around for a very, very, very long time which is why it's best to simply not get hooked in the first place. Now, specifically talking about alcohol, because alcohol is what we're going to be starting with. Heavy episodic drinking is consuming six or more alcoholic drinks at one sitting at least once per month. Binge drinking is drinking like nine at a sitting. I mean, it's a lot at a sitting within a, within a short period of time. But yes, uh, consuming six or more alcoholic drinks at one sitting at least once per month is generally not good for you. And by alcoholic drinks, what they mean is the equivalent of one ounce of alcohol, which is generally a 12-ounce beer, a six-ounce glass of wine, or a shot of hard liquor, um, which for a lot of people, they might get those six or more drinks in one large fruity beverage. Um, yeah, it's good to keep track of how much you're drinking, which brings me to drinking. Now, like I said, drinking by itself is not necessarily a disorder. It is indeed possible to drink alcohol and to not be dependent on it, to not have it become a problem. Uh, unfortunately, however, alcohol is so common and so commonly abused that it's going to take up a pretty good chunk of this chapter. The prevalence is roughly 13% of the American public meet the criterion for alcohol abuse, which I suspect may have to do with the episodic drinking or the number of drinks per week. I mean, there's 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 any any number of things, and 5% meet for, meet uh, the criteria for alcohol dependence, that they are dependent on the drug. That's one in 20 people basically have to have alcohol to function, because alcohol is pretty vicious in terms of what it does to you. I'll get to that in a little bit. Start out with some more possibly scary numbers. 23% of Americans report binge drinking, which is five or more drinks at least once in the previous month. Five or more drinks at, at one sitting, I should say. At least once in the previous month. Uh, we do know that those 5% of the population that are alcohol dependent are probably going to have their lifespan reduced by about 12 years on average. That's what? One-sixth or one-seventh of a lot of people's lives? <laughs> I mean, that's a, that's a good chunk of time. That's how much time you basically spent, you know, in elementary school through high school. Uh, and a lot of that, it might be because of the effect of the alcohol itself, in terms of damage to the body, it could be because of driving while drunk or doing other things while drunk and accidents. And there's all sorts of things that can basically cause this. One third of all arrests in the United States involve alcohol abuse at one point or another, which if you watch any of those various cop shows, whether it's good old cops or live PD or Alaska Patrol or whatever all the rest of them are, is probably not too much of a surprise. Because they deal a lot with people who are basically, if you pardon the expression, drunk off their ass. And so they wind up getting arrested or they do something stupid like driving or, yeah, it's, um, it's not good. They beat up on each other. It used to be that men drank more than women. Men were more likely to be alcoholic than women. Well, you've come a long way, baby. Women now drink as much as men in the United States. There doesn't seem to be real differences between the sexes. Now, they may drink different things, but alcohol is alcohol, whether you get it in a wine or a frou-frou drink or whether you get it in a can of beer. It's still alcohol. So, I also, a lot of people with other disorders also have alcohol problems. It's quite possible that people are using alcohol in order to more or less treat the disorder that they have. It's not a particularly good method, but for instance, there are people who are depressed who treat their depression by drinking because the alcohol 
means that they don't really remember and it makes them feel better at least for a little while or if they're stressed people might drink or i mean yeah we drink for a lot of reasons and we drink a lot so it doesn't necessarily show up by itself it may indeed be part of something else the clinical picture of alcohol related disorders is not pretty the effects on the human body or anybody that takes this in are global. This is not a drug that just affects one little part of the body. It affects you top to toe. It affects everything. And it usually doesn't affect things uh, in a good way. Although I will say that it does appear that for adult male humans, drinking one drink a day appears to be healthier than not drinking at all. This does not appear to be true for females, but for males, it appears that drinking one alcoholic drink a day is healthier than not drinking at all. At least that's what they say now. Who knows what they'll say later. I will, however, point out that you cannot save all the drinks up and have them all on Friday. So what does it do? Well, the brain starts to release the endogenous opiates. Those are our body's own inbred opiates that make us feel better, help deal with pain. Alcohol being a depressant eventually starts to slow everything down, starting with at impulse control, which is why some people think that alcohol is a stimulant, because they think that when they drink alcohol, they're more likely to do stupid things, which is absolutely correct. But they're more likely to do stupid things because the alcohol is taking care of impulse control. And if you drink enough alcohol, it can eventually depress everything, including breathing. Women don't tend to metabolize alcohol as well as men do. Um, we're not sure why. Uh, normally, women have more body fat than men do, and normally body fat helps, you know, uh, reduce the speed a person gets drunk, but it's not necessarily true with women. We, we don't know why. It also does appear that people um, of diff from different parts of the world, whose ancestors are from different parts of the world, may indeed metabolize alcohol differently. Um, people whose ancestors came from Europe metabolize alcohol pretty well for the most part, but people whose ancestors came from East Asia very often don't metabolize alcohol well. Native Americans uh, may not metabolize alcohol very well. It, it really can vary. Now, how alcohol affects a person depends on how much tolerance a person has. I went out drinking once with a friend of mine, I could drink half a drink and feel it because I have no alcohol tolerance whatsoever because I very rarely drink. He could drink, you know, several beers before feeling it. And that, that worried me. And after I told him, it worried him a little bit. As does food in the stomach. Food in the stomach helps to basically slow down uh, the metabolism of alcohol. It doesn't get into your system quite as fast. You don't get drunk quite as fast. The amount of body fat a person has, the more body fat a person has, the more it can indeed literally absorb alcohol. So the person may not get as drunk, but they may stay drunk longer. And indeed, it can cause liver damage. Alcohol is a poison. But ethyl alcohol, the type that we drink, is a poison that our body is able to deal with given time and not too large of a dosage. And the liver basically metabolizes it into something that is relatively harmless, although often very high in calories. But with time, the liver can indeed become damaged. And after about the age of 35, your liver doesn't repair itself very well. So, yeah, that could be a problem. As I said before, alcohol does indeed have a lot of calories. It also can impair the body's ability to utilize, utilize certain nutrients. It uh, prevents these nutrients from being metabolized. It can People can be drinking alcohol instead of eating healthy foods, which can be very bad. Um, in fact, there's something called Korsakoff syndrome. It's also called alcohol amnestic disorder. Because we need a little tiny bit of thiamine in our diet, and if we don't get it, it actually causes our hippocampus to deteriorate. People who drink all of their meals may find themselves, for an extended period of time, may find themselves having problems with their memory because of a thiamine deficiency. Pretty much eating almost anything with your alcohol will prevent that, because you don't need much but trust me, there are people that drink all their meals. There are people that wind up with Korsakoff because of a lack of thiamine. And I'll continue this very cheerful slide in the next lecture.